All right, everyone. So um, we just finished up uh, step two, um, some of the special issues when it comes to step two. And so today we're going to be, uh, or in this lecture, uh, we're for sure going to be doing step three. We'll see how long it takes me to do step three. Um, and we may include some parts of step four as well. But um, for now, we're just going to kind of jump into step three. Um, and so step three, we know is determining the transaction price. And so what are some issues with that? Um, one of the common ones is a situation where you have variable consideration um, and, and variable consideration um, is really a situation where some or a portion of the sales price is not determined or cannot be exactly known. And so, you know, there could be things like rebates, uh, rebates, bonuses, discounts, all these things that might change ultimately, sorry, I have a dog here, um, uh, change what, uh, what the, um, uh, what I actually collect when I make my sale. And so uh, what do we do when the amount is not exactly known? Uh, there's really two ways we can do it. One is called uh, using the expected value and the other one is using the most likely amount. If you remember, we talked about revenue recognition being about you know recognize revenue for the amount you expect to receive. And so in this case, there's really kind of two ways to kind of measure that expectation. One is an expected value. And, and the way I think about an expected value is, is really about an average. Um, and so I could have several distinct outcomes. I could kind of take the average of those outcomes um, and that'd be an expected value. Or let's say I have like a continuous distribution where, you know, um, where there's like a rate per sale or something like that, um, where you have a distribution of outcomes. Um, that's where you're going to use an expected value. Um, a most likely amount would be a situation where maybe you have distinct outcomes and one has a significantly higher probability than the others. And especially if it's, you know, 60 or 70 percent probability where there's sort of one outcome that dominates the other outcomes, then rather than taking some sort of average, you may choose to do a most likely amount. And so um, the distinction between the two with an expected value, it's more like an average with the most likely amount, it's the one with the highest probability. And so there is judgment as far as which method you wanna use. I would say there are certain situations where expected value makes sense. Like I talked about that continuous outcome. Okay, then you can't use a most likely amount because there is no most likely amount. Um, you could similarly you know, think about, okay, I have a bunch of different outcomes and there's really no, not one that dominates as far as, you know, as far as probabilities is concerned. And so maybe that's when an expected amount would make sense as well, um, uh, but or, or sorry, an expected value would make sense. But when you use the most likely amount, it's one where sort of one of the probabilities is significantly more, you know, and so um, there is judgment in that, but we'll talk about how to handle it. All right, so let's uh, use an example. So they provide some consulting services uh, to train salespeople for a client. Uh, they are paid $50,000 on January 1st, and they complete the services on January 31st. Um, they do get a tiered based payment um, based on client sales, but notice they, they complete their service on January 31st, but their bonus or their tiered payment is based on sales in February and March. And so notice we're going to complete our services at one point in time, and then the payment is going to be determined at a future date. And so they look at this and it's something they've done a lot. And for this client, this is their expectation. They think, well, with a $10,000 probability, uh, $10,000, we think there's a 55% chance we're going to get that, a 35% chance we're going to get $5,000, and a 10% chance that we're only going to get $1,000. Now, with this one, um, I, uh, you know, we think about um, different outcomes. Obviously, there are three distinct outcomes, so it's not like a continuous situation. Um, $10,000 has the highest probability. Um, but there is a little bit of gray area on this one where it's not clear whether it is so much higher that it is the where the most likely amount is the only logical uh, solution or the only logical amount to to record. Um, and so we're going to kind of walk through this a little bit where um, where we're not exactly where, where we're not exactly sure. But um, regardless of uh, oh, by the way, on the test, it's going to be very clear. I'm going to make it very clear which method is appropriate. Um, but when we look at this, the, the key that we're kind of talking about here is we, whatever method we determine, there's ultimately an outcome where we've got to reconcile things. And so we're going to kind of walk through two scenarios, scenario A, where we get the $10,000 bonus, bonus, and then scenario B, where we get the $1,000 bonus. And so 
Um, when we think about this situation, we have this expectation of, of 10,000, 5,000, or 1,000. Again, there's really two options. Uh, one is an expected bonus or the expected value, and that's a weighted average, right? And so if we're going to talk on average, uh, we need to weight the three. And so, you know, there's a 55% probability that we get 10,000, a 35% probability that we get 5,000, and a 10% probability that we get 1,000. And so if we do a weighted average of those three outcomes, uh, we get an, an expected bonus of 7,350. Now, the benefit of this method is that if I do this enough times, on average, I'm going to be right. The downside of this method is that I will never get exactly $7,350. So no matter what I do, I'm going to have to make some sort of adjustment if I use this method. I'm not saying that's wrong, but that is a downside of this method. Pretty much no matter what, I'm going to have to make some sort of adjustment or reconciliation when I actually get paid my bonus because I'm never going to get exactly $7,350. Um, the other acceptable method would be used to use the most likely amount, which would be $10,000. Uh, the, the downside of this is that um, uh, over time, I'm going to systematically probably over-recognize the bonus. And so um, I'm kind of initially... If you think about all transactions, I'm kind of initially overstating um, my uh, my outcome. I'm overstating my revenue initially. And so that's kind of a downside. Um, the, the plus side on this one is that 55% of the time, I'm going to have no reconciliation to do. I'm good. To, I'll be good to go. Um, and so, um, again, pluses and minuses to each one. We're going to walk through both methods. Um, knowing that, you know, on the test, again, there's going to be one clear. So if all the prob if two of the probabilities were the same, you're going to use the most, uh, you're going to use the expected bonus. If one was, you know, 80% probable, then you'd use the most likely amount. All right. So um, let's talk about the January 1st and 31st. So again, we get that initial payment. Um, when we get the initial payment, uh, the full amount is deferred revenue, right? Because I haven't done any of the work yet. And so throughout the month of January is where I'm earning that revenue. So initially, when I get paid the $50,000, I now need to earn that $50,000 throughout the month of January by providing my services. And so on the 31st, I will have completed my services. But I also need to think about, okay, since I've completed my services, I also now have this expectation of getting a bonus. And remember, we record revenue when we have an expectation and when we've transferred the good or service. So we've satisfied both of those in terms of the bonus. And so now what we have is we need to unwind the deferred revenue of 50,000. We also need to record something related to the bonus. And in this case, we're gonna use the 7,350 just because we can illustrate going in both directions with that one. Um, but we're gonna use that expected bonus knowing that we know that we're, we're going to have to make some sort of adjustment in the future. But the reality is I can recognize revenue for that bonus because I have transferred the good or service and I have an expectation. If I have those two things, I can recognize revenue. So at the end of January, I can recognize the revenue related to that bonus. And so my full service revenue for the month of January on January 31st is the initial $50,000 payment, which was deferred. And now... Uh, the expected bonus for a total of $57,350. So that is our total revenue that we would record on January 31st uh, because we have transferred the good or service and that is the expected amount or the expected value of the service that we provided. Okay, so now March 31st, we fast forward. We've, we've now watched their sales occur and we know what bonus we're gonna get. And so in, in scenario A, uh, we're going to get the $10,000 bonus in scenario B, we're going to get the $1,000 bonus. And so thinking about A, um, of course, we're going to receive the cash. And then we got to think about the rest of it. So you, you can pause here and think about it or, you know, just kind of keep trucking along with me. Um, but what really what we have, of course, um, the easy part is we are going to receive the $10,000. And, and by the way, on a test, don't miss layups. Uh, make sure you get the easy one, right? So make sure you get the fact that they receive $10,000 cash. That's an easy part of the journal entry. Uh, we also know that now that the cash payment has been uh, has been paid, uh, that receivable that we had previously recorded, uh, that needs to come off of our books. And so that was a, a receivable. So it was an asset, initially had a debit balance. So to get rid of that asset, we need to credit that account. Um, and so then the service revenue adjustment 
is what reconciles the two. So notice in this case, we initially recorded 7,350. Our realization was 10,000, which means we need to record another $2,650 in service revenue in order to get to the full amount that we ended up receiving. And so now it's reconciled. So now at the end of the day, we've got our um, $10,000 additional cash, we've got $2,650 of additional service revenue, and we're done with this client. Uh, in scenario B, it's a little bit different, of course, because in this case, instead of getting 10,000, we only get 1,000. And so in that case, you know, the bonus receivable still comes off the books, but the reality is if we look at this difference, and so now we have a situation, if I could draw an arrow the right way, now we have a situation where the bonus that I had previously recorded is more than what I actually received. And so my adjustment is a decrease, which is a debit, a decrease to my service revenue. And so what ends up happening is your service revenue is overstated in January, and then it's understated in February, but together, January and February are accurate. So that's kind of the idea of this kind of two-step. You initially record the expectation, and then after the fact, you reconcile it. And so you might be off by a month, but in total, you'll be good to go. All right, so now we're going to kind of post these to our T accounts. And so we're just going to kind of watch how this kind of flows through because it's important, I think, to kind of see something uh, at the end of the day. And so we initially record the cash payment, uh, of course, that deferred revenue. Then at the end of the month, when we actually receive, or sorry, we, we complete the service, um, then of course, now we've got um, that deferred revenue comes off our books, right? That's an important part, if you can see my underline over there. Uh, and now I've recorded the service revenue for the expected amount. Part of that service revenue, of course, is this expected bonus. Um, so that is the bonus we expect to receive. Uh, again, it's based on a number that will never be realized, but on average over time, that will be the amount that we expect. And so now let's kind of talk about scenario A. So in scenario A, we kind of have everything kind of lined up here. Um, now we basically sort of populate everything in. And so you notice we have another debit to our cash, our bonus receivable comes off of our books, and we have another over here, $2,650 of service revenue. And so when we close everything out at the end of March, so when, that's, when this transaction is sort of fully, uh, has fully played out, uh, notice that looking at the balances, the cash that I receive of 60,000 um, and the service revenue that I record of 60,000, they are equal. And that's the way that it should be. Ultimately, the revenue in this type of situation, the revenue should equal the cash I actually receive from the service that I provide. And that's where we end up. But of course, it took three months to get there because we had to let the transaction play out um, uh, through the service, through the sales of the client uh, for February and March. Uh, and of course, we, we as we would expect, the deferred revenue balance is zero and the bonus receivable at that point is zero. So I'm just trying to illustrate the idea that at the end of the day, the cash that I receive and the service revenue that I record once everything has played out should be equal and they are. All right, so um, the next scenario is um, a right of return. Um, and so uh, sometimes you may make a sale and a customer has a right to return the goods to you. Um, you know, there's this theoretical idea in the book about estimating sales return at the same time of the sale. Most companies don't do that. Instead, they do like, a, like an adjustment. Um, and, and so when that return comes, uh, you just record it as a return and it's a contra revenue account. Um, and so that sales return ends up being a contra revenue account. Um, it is not a reduction to sales revenue. So just understand that if you have a right to return, you do not reduce your sales revenue in stored. Instead, you record a sales return. And we'll get into more to that, uh, more detail on that in the next chapter. Um, another aspect of determining the transaction price is a situation where there is a third party. And so when we talk about the seller, the seller sometimes can be a principal and the seller or at least the agent of the seller can sometimes be a third party. Um, and so um, whenever we have these middleman relationships, it does cause some confusion and it's very common to have these relationships. So uh, we're gonna kind of walk through an example. So let's say I book a room at the Biltmore Hotel uh, and I book it through Expedia. So in this case, Expedia is a third party. Um, I pay Expedia $250 for the room. Uh, Expedia collects or keeps 10,000, sorry, $10 and remits the remaining $240 to the Biltmore. 
And so let's think about the Biltmore Hotel and Expedia and how should they recognize revenue or how much revenue should they recognize and when should they recognize it? All right, so again, you might wanna pause and think about it, but I'm gonna kind of walk through it. The key though, when you're thinking about it is what is the responsibility for each person and when have they fulfilled that responsibility, right? So Biltmore is the principal, meaning it's their room and Expedia is the agent. They're the ones that arranged for the sale. They were a middleman. And so what is Expedia's responsibility and when did they fulfill that responsibility? And then what is the Biltmore's responsibility? And when is their responsibility fulfilled? And so let's talk about Expedia. So Expedia's obligation really is only the reservation. The value of that through this transaction, it's very hopefully fairly obvious that the value of making the reservation is $10. And so they only recognize $10 in revenue, but they can recognize the revenue as soon as the reservation is finalized or complete, not until the stay, but they recognize it as soon as the reservation is finalized. Um, there may be some situation where somebody can cancel. So it, there could be a little bit, you know, um, there could be a little bit of a hang up there. Uh, but in general, as soon as they've done their job, which is to finalize the reservation, they can recognize the revenue for that sale. Uh, but the amount is limited just to the fee that they collect. Whereas the Biltmore, the value of the room really is $250. Um, and so in this case, Biltmore would recognize $250 of revenue. And then they would probably have some sort of a commission expense of $10 on their financial statement. Um, but for them, even though they get to recognize revenue for the gross amount, um, they really have to wait until the stay because that is their obligation. Their obligation is to provide a room. And so, and so until they've provided that room, they cannot recognize revenue. And so again, principal versus agent, there is a little bit of a difference between the two. Um, and in class, obviously, we might have more discussion, but hopefully that hits the highlights for you. All right. Uh, the next topic under transaction price is the time value of money. Yes, it has it has returned. It has reared its ugly head. Um, and, and how do we apply it here? And so uh, the way that US GAAP handles delays in payment is if there is a significant delay, then US GAAP infers that there is some sort of financing arrangement. So if I make a sale and I agree to accept payment significantly later than the sale, then what US GAAP is saying, listen, you are making a financing arrangement. So that means that that part of your transaction is, um, is a sale and part of your transaction is a finance charge. All right. So um, so let's kind of talk about uh, the different timing of these elements. So um, if the payment happens before the transaction date, so in other words, you could get paid maybe significantly before you provide the good, uh, then the financing arrangement is a situation where they believe the seller is or they're going to treat the seller as if they are borrowing money. If the payment happens after, which is really where we're going to focus, if the payment happens after, then they infer that the seller is actually lending to the buyer. So either the, the, the seller is borrowing or the seller is lending. But either way, there is a financing arrangement if there is a significant delay. All right, so um, if we're in a situation where there's a significant delay, the key is, is there is going to be sales revenue at the time of the sale, but then there's also gonna be in the case of uh, borrowing interest expense, or in the case of lending interest revenue. So again, our focus in this chapter is on the seller. So if the seller, if there's an inferred borrowing arrangement, the seller is gonna have an interest expense. If there's inferred uh, lending arrangement, then the seller is gonna have interest revenue. Um, in practice, um, there, uh, what do they, what, how do we think about um, what significant means? Uh, significant basically is any kind of idea of it's a material. Um, and really under GAAP, uh, sort of the, the the threshold is about one year. So if, if, if you borrow or lend for more than a year or the sale and the payment is different by more than a year, then you must apply TVM. Um, but um, companies could apply time value of money even if it's less than a year. It's not like you can't. It's just saying if you're more than a year, then we do infer a financing arrangement. There's really no judgment at that point. All right, so uh, a key factor in this is that firms must uh, must use the most clearly determinable, in other words, the most reliable imputed interest rate. Um, now, 
And what it means that is, is that there is judgment even in determining the interest rate that should be applied to the transaction. So if you think about time value of money, you have the cash flow, and then you have the interest rate that you use related to that cash flow. And so there is judgment in gap on what interest rate you use. You need to use the most reliable one. And so usually it's a trade-off between two things. So, um, so either the sales price of the good or service or some sort of discount rate that's internal to the company. Usually it's one of those two things that's more reliable. So either, you know, if you think about um, if I'm selling big pens or something like that, I mean, that's kind of almost a commodity. So you can very easily, you know, obtain a very reliable sales price um, for a big pen. But if I did like a custom piece of manufacturing equipment, uh, then maybe it'd be more difficult. And so what you can see is sometimes the sales price can be very reliable and sometimes the sales price can't isn't very reliable. And then the other side of that transaction is, okay, does the firm have some sort of debt instrument they can point to to say, okay, that's a comparable interest rate. And so you really have this judgment uh, of trading off those two. And so sometimes the sales price is going to be more reliable. Sometimes the discount rate or the internal discount rate is going to be more, more reliable and you have to use judgment. Now on a, on a test, I'm going to be very clear on which one, which one is more reliable, but just understand in practice, there is a lot of judgment. So your manufacturer sells a custom made piece of machinery on February 1st, 2021. The company agrees to accept a payment of 400,000 on August 1st, 2022. So we're outside of a year. Manufacturer's internal borrowing rate is 6%. Uh, there are no comparable equipment sales. The manufacturer estimates that the market value of the machinery is 350,000 record the journal entries. All right, so the first thing you got to do in this type of problem is apply time value of money to the transaction. And so if we think about the time value of money, I'm going to use our financial calculator. We have our different inputs, our N, our I slash Y, our PV, our payment, and our FV. In option one, uh, in option one is a situation where we're going to use uh, the $350,000. We're going to say, okay, what if we determine that the market value of the machinery is more reliable than the 6% discount rate. Because that's really our choice is between th those two things. Is the $350,000 estimated market value more reliable than the 6% discount rate? Which one is it? And I'm just going to kind of show you the math, you know, sort of using both. So if we determine that the $350,000 is more reliable, and then we fill in the information in our calculator. We know that the payment happens one and a half years away. And so, by the way, uh, absent some sort of monthly payment or something like that, we use years. So for these problems, always use years. And so it's a year and a half away. So the N is 1.5. We are suggesting that the equipment today is worth $350,000. But we've already told you that contractually, I've agreed to receive $400,000 a year and a half from now. So this is the two elements of the time value of money calculation. We can see that, well, somehow this company is indifferent between receiving $350,000 today or receiving $400,000 a year and a half from now. And so given that trade-off, we can now calculate the interest rate. And so the interest rate, if under this assumption, is a 9.31 annual percentage rate, so 9.31%. And option two uh, now we have the interest rate, but we do not have a present value. So essentially we're saying in option two that this is not reliable. Instead, we're going to focus on the 6% being the reliable measure. And so we put that information in, same year and a half, the future value of the payment that I'm receiving is still $400,000. There's no recurring payment. Uh, but now notice in these two boxes, really kind of comparing the two, we have uh, in the first scenario, we had the present value and then we solve for the interest rate. In the second situation, we have the interest rate. And so now we need to solve for the present value. Uh, and what can we conclude about this? In other words, will, when I solve for this, am I going to get 350,000? Hopefully you got the answer very quickly. The answer is no, because the only way I'd get $350,000 is if I use a 9.31 interest rate. I'm not using that interest rate. Therefore, I am not getting $350,000. Now here's the real tough question. And we're gonna ask this in class. Given that we're using 6%, when I solve for the present value, am I going to get more or less than 350000 So again, just pause, think about it, more or less. And the answer is more. You're going to get more. 
So a lower discount rate is going to increase the present value given the same future value. And so when we solve for that, we get 366,523. So you can see, depending on which one we determine is more reliable, it would change the present value. And we're gonna talk about why that becomes important here in a minute, but now we've fundamentally changed the way we're doing our time value of money calculation. All right, so real quick, given these two options, we have an internal borrowing rate, and then we have a market value of a custom-made piece of equipment. Which one do you think is more reliable? And again, I hope the answer here is fairly obvious, option two. So on a test, option two is the best answer here. And so we would move forward with option two and start doing our journal entries. And hopefully now we can start putting this together a little bit. So the step one, apply time value of money. Step two, use that information to actually do the journal entry. And so on February 1st, 2021, when I make this sale, uh, I'm going to record two things. First of all, I am going to record the fact uh, that I have this receivable. So I got a $400,000 receivable. It's due in a year and a half. I'm going to carry it at its face amount. And then we'll kind of go from there. The second piece of this, which is very important, is that the sales revenue is the present value. And so the sales revenue that we record is the present value from our time value of money transaction. Because essentially what it's saying is if the customer had paid cash today, I would have been willing to receive or willing to accept $366,523. That's what I would have accepted. So that's really the value of the sale. Now, anything I earn above the value of the sale, that is in, that is what I'm earning for the for financing the sale. So it's not sales revenue anymore. Now it's interest revenue. But when do I earn the interest revenue? Do I earn it today? No, I earn it over time. So at the time of this transaction, I haven't earned anything. And so the way that we account for that is we actually assign a discount to the AR. And so really the way that this ends up uh, sort of looking is you can see that it's a uh, an asset, right? So this account is an asset. And so if I combine these two accounts, initially what it looks like on my books, it looks like I have a net receivable of $366,523. And essentially what it's saying is, okay, I made a sale today. And in terms of today's dollars, the client owes me $366,523. But over time, what's going to happen? They're going to start owing me more and more and more and more. Essentially, as interest accrues, they're going to start owing me more money and more money and more money and more money until eventually, um, in a year and a half, it will have accrued to $400,000. They'll make the payment and we'll be done. Uh, this is one of the more difficult concepts, there's no doubt, in time value of money. So I guess, I'm guessing in class, we're going to be going back and forth a lot when we discuss this, but hopefully you kind of get the root of it uh, right here. Again, initially, the carrying value of the receivable is the present value, which equals the sales revenue amount. Over time, interest is going to recruit, and as interest accrues, that discount is going to go away, which then increases the net value or the net net uh, the net amount of the receivable. And again, we're going to kind of unwind this a little bit, and so you'll see it. So on 12-31-2021, uh, you know, time has passed. So we've we've now had 11 months pass. What happened over those 11 months? Well, we could have accrued interest every single month. You know, we could have done it at the end of February, end of March. Uh, in this case, we only are going to record accrued uh, revenue, interest revenue once a year. That's all we're going to do is once a year. So at the end of the year, we have to figure out, well, how much interest did I accrue? Now, on this test, I'm going to give you the amount, all right? Um, and, but I'm going to show you how it's calculated. Uh, and the way that you would calculate the interest is you start with your present value, $366,523, um, which is the carrying value of the receivable. So I want to be, be clear on here. Uh, that's the carrying value, oops, if I can get that, of the AR. And the carrying value is the gross receivable minus the discount. Um, you apply the interest rate to it. And in this case, of course, we know that the interest rate is 6%. And then we have to figure out, well, how many months did we have interest accrued? Well, we only had 11 months of interest accrued. Sorry, my dog's nudging me. Sorry about that. Um, we only had 11 months of interest accrued. And so not a full 12 months, just 11 months. 
And so when we do the math, we see that we need to accrue $20,159. And so our interest revenue is a credit for $20,159. And the way that we're going to handle that is we reduce the discount. So what happens to that discount is its balance keeps coming down as we accrue interest revenue until by the end, the discount goes away. Uh, but I want to be very clear on this calculation. Um, while I'm showing you how it's calculated here, on a test, you would just be given the $20,159. I just wanted you to see where it came from. All right, so then once the, the, the receivable is actually paid, how do we handle that? Well, the easy part of it is, of course, I receive $400,000 cash uh, and I get rid of my receivable. Um, and then the second piece is I need to record the remaining interest revenue because, again, time has passed. Uh, there's been another uh, seven months uh, that has passed. And so since another seven months has passed, uh, I need to accrue seven months of interest. Uh, the calculation is actually pretty simple um, in that, well, originally I said that the total amount that I needed to record, uh, the total discount was $33,477. I already recorded $20,159, which means now I need to record the remaining 13,318. And so um, the second piece of that is I record the interest revenue, 13,318. I reduce the discount, 13,318. And now um, we are, uh, we've kind of closed the loop on this transaction. Everything's off our books and we're ready to march forward. Okay, so that is, uh, we're gonna kind of stop there. So that is some special issues when it comes to determining the transaction price. Um, next time we're going to pick it up with some special issues when it comes to allocating the transaction price. But uh, again, this is going to be one you're going to want to review a lot because I know there's a lot of detail. Um, so, so it's challenging, uh, but I know that you're up for the challenge.